Hi, and thank you for joining me for another video. And friends, today we're, we're going to be discussing Haftarat Noach, the portion of the prophets pertaining to the Torah portion of Noach. And this Haftarah begins from Yeshayahu, Perak Nun Dalid, Pesukim Aleph to Yud, or Isaiah 54, verse 1 to 10. So before anything, again, contextually, we must understand this here, as it's describing the Almighty's dialogue with Yeshaya. So the fact is that these words are being spoken on a public podium to the children of Israel, while at the same time codifying and illustrating Torah ethics in a practical manner for all listening, including yourselves. And clearly, friends, we see that this is the case in the beginning of the Haftarah, because as we see that the parak starts off with a poetic description of future, sovereign, prosperous Israel. It reads, Rani akara lo yalada. Sing out, O barren one who has not given birth. Break out into glad song and be jubilant. One who had no labor pains for the children of the desolate city, Yerushalayim, outnumber the children of the inhabited city, says Hashem. So this is very promising. This is very beautiful. But you know what? Before I really try to get into this, I really don't think that I've laid down a systematic method in understanding the Nevi'im or the prophetical writings. And this, as you will soon see, is a must in properly understanding the narrative within all these Haftorot and a necessity in keeping you grounded in normative Judaism. And you are probably wondering, what is the source for this systematic understanding of the prophets? And friends, the answer is Torah and ultimately logic. And both, in a sense, work together, guarding each other. And as we break down these steps, these principles, you will see these concepts, the concept of Torah and logic, you will see them shine. And I think that the narrative being depicted here, right now, is ideal for a quick breakdown of these four prophetic principles. Lest one should think, because the portion we just read in Haftarat Noach is in some way unavoidably destined to happen under the ticking of some apocalyptic clock. But anyways, friends, principle one in understanding prophetical statements is that all, all biblical prophetical blessings, i.e. words of the Almighty spoken through the mouths of men, are only conditional promises. And not what must always happen, but only what should happen, i.e. words that are only activated through our actions by us keeping Torah. Again, unless stated otherwise. And friends, by simply misunderstanding or overlooking this principle, this is really what has given birth to purposeless religion. Not just in the Jewish world, but especially the Christian prophetical world. And like I said, that the beginning of this Haftarah is perfect. It's a perfect example where we're seeing blessing and prosperity being spoken over the children of Israel. Teaching us that this does not in any way mean that all this must unconditionally happen, mainly because of the two very, very important words of free will. And honestly, it's this form of thinking and interpretation that has given birth to the religious age of entitlement we live in today. The notion that because we Jews exist, that in some way we deserve. Or the idea that no matter what we do or don't do, some Messiah is destined to bail us out. And worse, some utopian age of peace and prosperity is awaiting us. And yes, friends, all these misconceptions are loosely based mainly from the Sprachim in Nevi'im. Why? Because we mustn't forget about free will, my friends, which is exactly what gets trampled upon if such unprecedented occurrences occur without it being the direct result of some decision we have collectively made as a group or people to either succeed or fail. Okay? So that's the first principle. The second principle are curses or problematic occurrences described in the prophets. And it's funny that Jews conveniently always interpret these in the past tense, unlike blessings which they always understand and interpret as occurrences which are destined to happen, no matter what we believe or how we behave. In other words, friends, in scripture, curses are typically according to the context they're laid out in, always understood as warnings, and mainly because this is what they are. They precisely are warnings, just as the previous principles of blessings is only to be understood as conditional promises of what may occur if we continue separating ourselves from the standard. 
So, as with every curse or day of destruction mentioned in Scripture, that they are all conditional warnings as well, as they logically should be. I mean, can you imagine that even after all our global problems are sorted out ethically, that we should still need to suffer because it happened to be written in some book outside of Torah? I mean, so much for ethical free will, huh? And you know what else? This places prophecy right where it's supposed to have been all along. In other words, in terms of what awaits us theologically, everything must stem from Torah, not books outside of Torah. And the Torah is very clear that Israel, Israel, my friends, only suffers for not keeping Torah, no matter what words some later prophet may have spoken. In other words, this is how we're supposed to interpret the prophets. Not building doctrine off of their words, but only understanding them through the guise of Torah. In other words, the Torah does not speak about the end of the world or some era of peace that will arise just because we happen to exist. No, friends, in Torah it is clear cut that every blessing and every curse is conditional. Conditional to what? Conditional to us keeping Torah. We make the choice. The ball is in our court. Like it says in Parashat Re'e that the Almighty, HaKodesh Borhu, He places before us death and life and blessing and cursing. And the choice is ours. And about the future, which would encompass, I would say, almost the majority of these haftorot, the Torah is clear in Devarim 29 and 30 that when Israel sins, they would be exiled. And when they repent, they would be brought back to their former glory. Which, if you think about it, is in line with these principles that I'm presenting you today. Okay, that's the second principle. Now, the third principle is the fact that prophecies were never meant to be carried over to encompass future generations that were unrelated contextually to the narrative at hand. Now, faithful statements about the good prevailing because they obey and trust Hashem is a non sequitur. How? Because, like we just said earlier, that we know that this is a Torah principle, that the nation that trusts and awaits on HaKodesh Borhu would prosper in every way. No, friends, I'm referring to taking some event described by the prophet that contextually has nothing to do with what is occurring in our world today and assuming that because it appears in this book, it in some way must come to pass or the prophet would be labeled a false one. And really, friends, this really is a concept made popular by the New Testament when Jesus makes a statement that heaven and earth will not pass away till everything in the prophets has been fulfilled. And understanding that is a bit biblically absurd, elevating the role of the prophets to only someone who predicts future events without any ethical, practical intent accompanied with it. Instead of what their role was all along, which was only as an instrument used by the Creator to Bring people back to Torah, and that's all. Because remember, who codified and compiled the works of the prophets in the first place, right? It was the court, what later became known as the Great Sanhedrin. And not to mention that even back then, they debated what books to include and exclude from their compilation of the prophets. A debate that lasted even decades after the death of J.C., which is something you should ask Karaites or Christians, that if they shun the judges or the historical court, the only individuals with the title rabbi or rav at the time, how could they even embrace the biblical canon which was compiled by these same rabbis? And something else you shouldn't overlook is that although Torah commands us to heed the words of the prophets, we were never, never told to codify their words in written form and use them as some sort of esoteric almanac for the future. No, as you know, friends, Codify them we did, but that codification was only to stand as a historical reference of what occurred and not in any way as a way for us to alter our future expectations or ideas, which is what has happened today, unfortunately. Because, friends, I must say that I honestly, honestly believe that every exhaustive and exclusive prophecy that were consequential to our actions either already took place or expired due to free will thwarting its consequences. This is how you study books outside of Torah, not as a pillar in themselves, but rather just as a guide to amplify Torah principles, which I must say is not the way they are studied today. When you see that people have theologically and doctrinally taken the prophets pretty much on their own, in other words, they've created religions just off of the words of the prophets. Which is really what would have happened with, let's say, the book of Jonah if it wasn't as contextually complete as it is. In other words, the difference with Jonah with, let's say, the other prophets is that in Jonah we got more of a clear-cut outsider's view of the actual facts on the grounds before and after. 
which goes for the Torah as well. Whenever you have a clearer narrative, less nonsense actually gets derived from it. In other words, many of the prophetical books encompass decades of exile and turmoil, which causes the proverbial lenses of theological history to get really fogged. Okay, so this leads me to the fourth principle, which really has to do with what we just said, and that's that we cannot, we cannot build doctrine off the words of the prophets. In other words, even the prophets themselves were forbidden from adding or taking away from the Torah. And this is something that virtually every Christian and Karaite virtually completely ignores nowadays. In other words, if you ask a Christian to justify everything he or she believes with only the Hebrew scriptures, you will find that about 98% of what they hold dear, theologically, is only derived from esoteric portions of the prophets and not Torah. Because like we said, that the job of the prophet was only to bring Israel back to Torah and never to get Israel to consider their words themselves Torah. And another area within this principle that I suppose I must mention is the fact that the books of the prophets are fallible. In other words, yes, you will find a few contradictions here and there. And why shouldn't you? I mean, they were penned by men and compiled and compilated by the Sanhedrin, another body of men who never claimed to have prophecy themselves, but were ultimately valued because of their good judgment, a judgment which was not even in unison when deciding what books to either include or exclude from what we call the prophets today. In other words, the words of the prophets are not to be considered divinely inspired, like we consider the text of the Torah divinely inspired, but rather only divinely inspired as if any one of us would have been inspired by the divine to compose similar religious literary works. Now, we both clearly understand that when the narrative states, thus says the Lord, that it is the words of God being spoken through the prophet. However, all this, or the works of the prophets, really is, is just a historical account of the narrative that occurred and not a guide or code literally developed or endorsed by the Almighty, like Torah. In other words, we don't hang on every word like we do in the Torah. Which is why there are many books of the prophets that do not exactly match up with earlier or later variants of the same work. But this, my friends, is really not such an issue. And um, the role of Israel checking and approving of prophets was a duty performed by the court as well. And yes, a duty and test that we assume was performed with every one of the canonical prophets. A test that didn't require them to be accurate about everything they said, but just accurate about the instructions the Almighty was giving Israel to come back. And friends, if we read and learn the prophets within these four principles in mind, Honestly, we will never, never fall into any cult or sect and actually begin to start practicing normative, healthy Judaism. So, that being said, back to the Haftarah. It says in the third pasuk, Ki yaminu shmol tifrotzi vezarech goyim yirash vearim neshamot yoshivu. For southward and northward you shall spread out mightily. Your offspring will inherit nations, and they will settle desolate cities. Now, this gives us a different look and perspective on an area that's been greatly misunderstood. That when Israel has bettered this world with Torah and mitzvot, that in some way this means that Israel will continue to be surrounded by non-Jewish nations who have adopted a seven-law belief system. Here it states that Israel will inherit the nations and will even settle their desolate cities. Now, what could this possibly mean, friends? Friends, look, weekly as we go through every one of these Haftorot, you will begin to see a glimpse of the mindset that these individuals and even the writers of these words had in mind, which was the ultimate hope that this world, my friends, would little by little accept Torah and convert to Judaism. Because honestly, friends, only a preconditioned mind would interpret every one of these passages to mean that the nations would be adopting some seven law belief system, which according to Halakha was never meant to be a religion, and at the same time choosing to be the servants slash slaves to the Jewish people. To the point that in the fifth pasuk, it's clear that it says, Elohei kol ha'aret yikare, that the God of Israel will be known as God of the whole world. That's what he shall be called. Now, Let's really stop and think. Is even believing in the God of Israel one of the seven laws? <laughs> and friends, the answer is no. Now, the prohibition against idolatry is surely one of them, but that does not include the positive command of belief in God. 
And friends, the reason I continue to press this issue is because no greater deception has been presented to the non-Jewish world than the interpretation of supposed eschatological scripture to describe the future nations as non-Torah keepers, in some way telling the world that it's not destined, so don't even try to convert to Judaism, that is. Then, in the ninth Pasuk, we see it say, Ki menoach zoli asher nishbati meor, menoach od ad ha'aretz ken nishbati miksof alaych umigar bach. That for the waters of Noah shall this be to me, as I have sworn never again to pass the waters of Noah over the earth. So have I sworn not to be wrathful and or rebuke you. And here we see how it gets tied into Parashat Noah. So here we can assume, being that it makes mention of the mobile of the flood, that the wrathfulness and the rebuke it's alluding to is that of complete annihilation, mainly because in many other places, not just within the prophets, but even in Sefer Yeshayahu itself, it uses the same words as used here in the Hebrew um, in terms of being wrathful and rebuking the children of Israel, which is why one has to be careful when trying to understand these writings, not to take Pesukim out of context. And this is uh, further ratified with when it says, Uvrit Shlomi, my covenant of peace. In other words, declaring that the door is always open to receive Israel's repentance. But anyways, friends, um, I think we'll end it here. For more information on anything Jewish, my friends, please visit TorahJudaism.org. Thank you.